Thanks for jumping in. It's great to see you up here this morning. Pete, thank you again. Appreciate you always. Um, it's nice to worship together. You're going to have a chance to engage in, in worship in, uh, in a little bit. The service isn't over. You're going to have a chance to, uh, to sing and express thanks to God and worship. And, and, and I wonder if we can just pray together. God, we just, oh, we acknowledge your spirit here. And we also acknowledge that that's really why we're here is to engage with you to, to have communion with you, to connect with you, to build relationship with you. God, I thank you that you're here with us. Um, and as we come from all of our, the different places that we've come from this week, God, I thank you that you've been with us, that you stay with us. And, uh, and, and I thank you again just for your presence and we acknowledge it. We thank you that you're good and I pray that you'd help us just experience your goodness this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Um, hey, so a couple weeks ago, we had an amazing staff meeting and it wasn't because Kurt or I were leading it. We had a chance to go into the Northeast and we had our staff meeting at a neighborhood center run by the Mustard Seed. And um, it was a brilliant conversation. It was so encouraging to see just the vision and, and I know many of you are familiar with the Mustard Seed and some of the work they do in our city um, just to, to, to help people um, in, in so many different ways. So we, uh, we got excited as we were having this conversation. We were like, Matt, how can we engage as a church? They're a mission partner of ours. How do we, how do we step in? How do we engage? And so uh, they gave us a great idea. So this isn't our idea. This is their idea. And we want to just kind of step in and say, man, we want to help. And so there's an amazing initiative that they are that collecting hundreds of backpacks for kids to go back to school. And, uh, and the reason for the initiative seems obvious, but there are kids that don't um, have um, that don't have backpacks when they go back to school and, and they need it. And so as, as an organization, they're like, how do we step in in some, a very practical way to just fill a kid with backpacks? So it's really an exciting initiative. So we as a church, along with a number of other churches in our city, are going to collect hundreds of backpacks. And we want to have them ready by the end of July so that they can, we can go there and then they're going to set up their space so that kids are basically like having a back-to-school shopping day and they get to fill their backpack with school supplies. Guys, this is a fantastic thing for us as a church to be able to do. We're excited about it and we're hoping you're going to get excited about it and not just in theory but in practice. So we want to jump in and uh, there's, there's cards that you're going to be able to receive. There's information on the website. There'll be information in the newsletter. There's information there as far as what are some things that you can get. So get a backpack, not one that's, that's had its days because your kids have grown up and it's completely destroyed now. Not that backpack. Get like a good backpack, a new backpack for a kid that they can go to school and they can have their first day with something that they can be proud of and, and it's got stuff that they can use for their start of school and it's just a great way for us to bless our community. In fact, I, I, can we just pause for a moment? I want to just pray over this initiative and the conversations that you have in your homes as you're talking as a family as you're talking with roommates, as you're walking through stores thinking, what is the stuff that we need to get for these students? Because the Holy Spirit is all over this, and I pray that he just guides this whole process for us as a church. So God, we just we give this initiative to you, and we ask you to lead us and guide us in small decisions that impact kids for, for potentially forever. And God, we wanna just give this back to you and we ask you to guide us and lead us. And as we step into this, I pray that kids are blessed and they just have another reminder that someone cares and that Jesus cares. In your mighty name we pray, amen. Okay, so question for you. How many of you, if you work in, an, in a job for a while, you start discovering rules, or if you go to school for a while, you start discovering rules and you think, what? I wonder where this rule came from. Why do we practice this rule? Where did this even, how did this become a thing, right? I'm sure, I'm sure this has been your, it's definitely been my experience, that you just kind of go, how did we start doing this? Does, does this really make any sense? And, and, and then again, students, I'm, I'm sure you just find yourself every once in a while asking, where, where did this rule come from, right? 
So according to, this isn't just unique to those in the room. This, this, is, this is something that questions are asked. I did a quick search online at farandwide.com. So according to farandwide.com, there's, there's rules that just kind of don't make a lot of sense literally around the world. Apparently it's illegal to build a sand castle in Spain. They just want to discourage sand castles apparently in Spain. <clears throat> they also encourage you to honk when passing a car on the freeway in New Jersey. It's illegal to chew gum in Singapore. It's illegal to wear a mask in public, apparently, in Denmark. It's illegal to fly a kite in Victoria, Australia, and in Buenos Aires, Argentina. That's like double whammies on the kite flying. It's illegal to kill Bigfoot in British Columbia. <laughs> Next time you're in the Okanagan, people, Hold down your temptation to share. Uh, it's illegal to wear a fake mustache in a church in Alabama. <laughs> so again, where in the world do these rules come from? Now, you might not be like barred from wearing fake mustaches in your work environment, but sometimes rules just seem to kind of create a life of their own, don't they? Um, so, but what if those rules, like, you can actually get in trouble for not following them. What if, what if those rules actually get in the way of how you treat other people? So we, we, we're in this middle of a series called Criticizing Jesus, and there's people that came to Jesus and they challenged him on specific things. So we have, we have quite an important topic to, to talk about today, and it has to do with some rules, and, and it kind of has to do with rules kind of gone wild. We're going to talk a little bit about Sabbath. Now, I don't know what your experience was with Sabbath. I, I, if you grew up in church, I'm guessing that there was at some point a conversation you had with an authority figure, could have been a parent or, or a, a teacher, where it was like, this is what you can and can't do on Sunday, right? And, and there's just there's rules that have been part of this process. And some of you may not have experienced this. I experienced this. For me, as an 11-year-old, my world collided on me when I was having this conversation with my dad about playing hockey, playing organized hockey on Sunday. And it was like, wow, I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how this has anything to do with my relationship with Jesus. And it was just, as an 11-year-old, this was, this was a bit of a deal for me, right? Um, so... What, what's significant, in fact, even as we think about context, a, a few years uh, earlier than that, we were going through a discussion as a church. I wasn't there, I wasn't even alive yet, but we were going through a conversation as a church with, with the people that were, were building this place. And at the time, they were like, parking lot? Who needs a parking lot? Because nobody shops on Sunday, and we're right across the street from a mall. We would never need a parking lot. So those of you who were here at the beginning, I know this was your experience. And so when we did a big renovation to the church, we literally had to build a parking lot because it wasn't because nobody shops on Sunday. So like context changes even in those few short years. And, and now life is, is, is very different even today when it comes to rules around Sabbath. But I want to take a second and jump back in history, not just 60 years, but we're going we're gonna to jump back into Jesus' time. And context has a lot to do with this story. But before we even give you some context, I want to talk to you about the significance of Sabbath to the Jewish people. This was a big deal. This was an identifying thing that set them apart from the nations around them. I want to, I want to read to you what N.T. Wright, just a, a brilliant scholar, has to say about the world of Sabbath. He says, for a Jew's world, the Sabbath had all the mixture of social pressure and legal sanction, but it meant, meant much more as well. It was a badge of Jewishness for people who'd been persecuted and killed simply for being Jewish. It was a national flag that spoke of freedom to come, of hope for the great day of rest when God would finally liberate Israel from pagan oppression. It looked back to the creation of the world and to the exodus from Egypt, and it marked out those who kept it as God's special people, God's faithful people, God's hoping people. It was, after all, a commandment deeply embedded in the Jewish scriptures. On a website called the Orthodox Union, which is a Jewish site, after describing what Sabbath is as far as a day set aside that, that, that people don't work, they say this, observance of this day has protected the, the Jewish people from assimilation throughout the ages. 
Man, there's identity in this for the Jewish people. This is like core. This is like what set them apart. That's the context world we're walking into today. So I wanna, we're going to go through this passage. There's two brief stories that we're going to talk about as it relates to Sabbath. We're going to talk about the, a little bit of context, and then we're going to jump in with some application questions, which, which are going to just help us process a little bit from our perspective. What does this mean for us today? So let's dive in. Um, starting at Mark chapter 2, verses 23, we read this. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, look, what, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? So just picture this. Jesus is walking along, and he's with his disciples, and they're walking through a grain field, and, and you know, just a stalk of grain, they just pull the head of grain off, and they put it in their hand, and they take the husk off of the grain, to reveal the seed, kind of like a sunflower seed, shelling a sunflower seed, same idea. And they, they take the grain out and they pop it in their mouth and they have a little snack. And Pharisees are looking at this and saying, what are you doing allowing your disciples to break the law? How is this breaking the law? For Jewish people at that time, this was breaking in the law. Let, now, the, what, when God gave the command of, of Sabbath, he said, don't work on this day. But there were some religious leaders who thought, nah, I think that needs a little help. We're going to add a few. So there, what became the 29 Sabbath laws were added to help clarify for the people of Israel what breaking the, the Sabbath law actually meant. I'm just gonna read a couple of them for you. This is from the Shabbat 7-2. This fundamental Mishnah, the Mishnah was basically the oral law that was given out and, and, and recorded. So this fundamental Mishnah enumerates those who perform the primary categories of labor prohibited on Shabbat or Sabbath, which number 40 less one. 39 laws of the Mishnah. They are grouped in accordance with their function. One who sows, one who plows, one who reaps, and one who gathers sheaves into a pile, and one who threshes, removing the kernel from the husk. That's number three, and number four is reaping, which another way of how they define that is basically plucking or pulling something off of any growing plant. And then when they say threshing, it's removing the seed from the husk. So the disciples went along in the field and they plucked a grain, a, a head of grain, and they threshed it. And the Pharisees are watching and they said, whoa, 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 lawbreaker. This is an interesting situation. You're Jesus, the son of God, who is perfect. Did he and his disciples just break the law? Is he still perfect after this situation? This is a big question. Because there's people that are watching this saying, hey, lawbreaker, right there. Now again, the Sabbath was a big deal. And I, I, I cannot overemphasize the tension in this conversation. Because at the end of the second little story we're going to look at, we get into death threats. This is a big deal. So, is Jesus and his disciples breaking the law? These additional 39 Sabbath traditions, let's be clear, are not equated with the law of God in God's eyes. But they sure were in the eyes of the Pharisees. They gave themselves the right to add to God's law, religious tradition, that in their mind equated with the very law of God. Wow, that is dangerous. But they had done it for a long time, and in their mind they were completely okay, it was acceptable for them to establish a law and enforce it and call it God's. Oh, we're going to get into some application conversations at the end, but friends, this is dangerous ground. So if you're Jesus, what do you do? What do you say in response? Where do you go with this? 
Put yourself in that moment. You've just been accused, along with your disciples, of breaking the law. What are you going to say? Any takers? <laughs> Jesus does what he often does in times like this. He goes back to the word of God. And let me just tell you, as somebody who is a follower of Jesus, that's a safe and good thing to do. He goes back to the word of God. There's tension. Where are we at? Now, Jesus understood the law and, more importantly, the purpose of the law. But in this moment, Jesus goes back to Scripture. Jesus points to Scripture because Jesus was a fan of Scripture. And I want to make, also make it clear that Jesus never broke or challenged God's law. He just understood it. So let's keep going. Verse 25, he answered, have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? Verse 26, in the days of Abiathar, the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for the priests to eat. Then he also gave some to his companions. So Jesus basically kind of establishes some precedent with the Jewish leaders. He says, I want to I wanna show you what David did. As, as, you, as I'm sure you've read, well, of course they've read, right? They, they, they memorized and knew this book of the law. Um, and so, and so, so they knew it. So, so David said, uh, David, or pardon me, Jesus said, I want to remind you what David did with his companions. Now, there's a whole conversation about Abiathar, and we're just not, we don't have time, we're not going to get in there, but it's a fascinating conversation as far as who David had a conversation with. Um, but basically, Jesus is doing, doing, I think, a couple things. I think one is he is establishing precedent. He references David and his companions, and he makes the comparison between him and his companions, a future king and a future king. And he basically says, um, David did it, and there's precedent, and we're doing it. Now, I, I think even more importantly, it seems that Jesus is also challenging the ritual, man-made tradition, with the heart and purpose and intent of the law, the actual law of God. So there were a number of times when Jesus challenged Pharisees or religious leaders when they got in the way because they were bent on following human tradition and not following the actual law of God. And Jesus understood why the law is there and sometimes he had to challenge their perspective because they put themselves in, in a situation where it wasn't theirs to, to rewrite or add to God's law, but they did it anyway. So Jesus goes on and he says to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. God instructed the people of Israel to remember the Sabbath. The commandment references the order of creation, an order of creation that God established with work and rest. There was a rhythm to it. And it was powerful. And God said, I want you to experience my presence with you. And God even called the day holy. And he said, you're going to experience my presence not from your busyness, but when you stop and receive something that's not from you. And there's something powerful in this rhythm. And Jesus wasn't challenging the rhythm. He was in challenging the intent of the law because Sabbath was made for people because God is for people and he wants to bless his people and he wants to walk with his people. Jesus does not break the Sabbath law. Jesus, Jesus is not disregarding or even challenging the law, but he challenges the misguided focus of the religious leaders who have lost the heart of why the law exists in the first place. Then he gets to the heart of the matter. He says in verse 28, so the son of man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Pharisees tried to keep everyone on the straight and narrow. They just felt that was their God-given right and duty. So it was their right to, to make sure there was enough laws and rules in place to correct people before they even made a mistake. And they set the pathway and they said, you need to follow the pathway because we're here on behalf of God. We're gonna speak for him. Now, when I make up what God's activity should look like in someone else's life, it becomes really easy for me to determine what godliness looks like for that person. Can you sit with that for one second? When I make a decision, here's what godliness looks like for you. Here's a law of God. I'm just going to add a little bit to it. And then I'm going to give that to you. There's actually a focus change for the person who's receiving instruction from me now all of a sudden their focus and, and what determines faithfulness is now whether or not they're in accordance with me as opposed to in accordance with God. That's a powerful misstep. 
When a society is dominated by laws and rules that meticulously lay out exactly how you are to act, and even when you are to act in certain ways, it can create a culture of fear. Again, it puts people in the place of God. The rules can actually turn our focus away from God. They can shift us away from what Jody talked about last week, a Jesus-centered life. And it can be about rules. Not even God-made rules, but man-made rules. Um, so, we're going we're gonna to kind of step into the next story. So we're going to take a look at, at, at chapter 3, um, starting at verse 1. Um, another time, Jesus went into the synagogue, and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. Now, the first one, I can kind of make some sense of, the reaping and the threshing. I honestly don't know what Jesus does that breaks the Sabbath in this situation. The work was basically a person with a withered hand hold up your hand and he healed it okay listen to this verse 2 again some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus so they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath so the the people that are there representing God we got to just catch this their intent in this moment is scrutiny and judgment and criticism. They're waiting for something to go wrong, right? They're waiting for it to trap him. They've set the trap. They're the, like the guy with the withered hand is there. Okay, he's there, he's set. Jesus is coming in, what is he gonna do? This is, this is just, they're watching him so they might accuse him. What is going on with the Pharisees? They they had taken ownership over over or control, pardon me, over something that they were never meant to control. Um, So again, I think what happens to the Pharisees in this moment is it leads to something that wasn't God made, but it was man made, and it leads to a level of self righteousness for them. So they're waiting as, as as the people represented God in this scenario. This is their posture, and I can only imagine Jesus in this moment who has come for the purpose to save the lost, and there's somebody with a withered hand and he wants to reach out and he wants to help and heal and restore. And the representatives of God that are in the room are waiting for him to do it so they can catch him. Surely that has to break the heart of God. This is a glaring example of the contrast between how Jesus represented God and how the Pharisees represented God and the posture in which they stepped into relationship. And friends, I, just, I, have, to, I have to just ask myself the question. When I engage with somebody in the name of Jesus, in the name of God, which side do I resemble? Is it the side reaching out in empathy and love and compassion or is it the side waiting for somebody to do something wrong? And I don't say that for you to ask somebody else. I just say that for us to internally process this for a minute. How are we stepping out? How are we representing God in the opportunities that we have with our community around us? So Jesus, watching this happen, he's like, I'm not going to sit back. I'm just not going to sit back. So we read in verse 3, Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, he didn't even do it quietly. He says to the man with the shriveled hand, stand up in front of everybody. This is too important. This is absolutely too important. I want you to take center stage and I want you to lift your hand. And we're going to see the, the, the heart of God demonstrated in this place today. Then Jesus asked them, as he, as, as, so the man's hand is, is still shriveled, he said, Jesus says, stand up in front of everyone. Verse four, then Jesus asked them, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill it? But they remained silent. Can, can you imagine being a Pharisee? Like Pharisees get a bad rap, and I, I, they just always do. But can you put yourself in, in their situation for a moment? You're trying 
to serve God. That, that at least at the beginning, at some part in the process, that's your intent. You're, you're really trying to faithfully serve God. This is a no-win question. Are, is, it, is it to do good or to do evil? To save life or, or to kill? Because if they say, well, to save, which is consistent with God's heart for his people, then they have to go back on how they have been leading. They have to repent in front of God and in front of people. The activity of God was taking place right in front of them and they were blind to it because Jesus wasn't religious enough. So he puts the question in the starkest terms, in words dripping with irony, it is more legal or lawful to do good or evil on the Sabbath. Is it better to save people or kill them? If the Sabbath speaks of creation and redemption, which is why God gave it to his people, if that's what it's about, the answer is obvious. And the current interpretation of the rules say otherwise, so much the worse for the current interpretation of the rules. At the end of the day, they were just off base. The Sabbath was about experiencing rest, freedom from your burdens. Jesus heals the, the man's hand. Verse five, he looked, he looked around at their anger and deeply distressed in their stubborn hearts said to the man, so Jesus is troubled by this. He says to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was completely restored completely restored. The heart of God was made evident in this situation. Restoration happened for this man. You would think if you're up to the activity of God, this is a good day. This is crazy how this ends. Verse six, then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. <laughs> two people that couldn't agree on anything or two groups of people that couldn't agree on anything all of a sudden are united on a, on a, on a common cause. Take down Jesus. So there's, there's, again, I just, I want to recognize the tension here because there's two people that, that leave this situation and they say, man, we only have one course of action. We have to get rid of this troublemaker because somehow he was, he was attacking their sense of what was right and wrong. Now, Jesus presses us in this because, like, again, something got stirred up here. Jesus presses in, but I want to remind you how this story between Jesus and the Pharisees ends. Because Jesus, if he, if he took the approach that the Pharisees' approach was, is he would get all defensive and he would get an army to combat, right? But what does he do? How does the story actually end? He goes to the cross for them. Some reject him and some receive Jesus and accept his gift of salvation. Some people in the room receive his gift of salvation. As Jesus hung on the cross and declared forgiveness, Father, forgive them because they just don't know what they're doing. We see the ultimate response to criticism. The ultimate response to criticism is a demonstration of grace for all of the critics that were assembled there that day. So I wanna, I wanna just take a moment, and there's just a couple application points, just some questions that I think are helpful for us to consider as we kind of process what in the world, like how does this connect with us? And there's something that's so consistent, and it's not just consistent with this story. If you track Jesus' life, you will see this, this how he lived over and over and over again. So we're gonna press into a couple questions. I'm just gonna ask you a couple more. Uh, uh, um, so question number one, what does love look like in this situation? If you're to look at Jesus' life, I think you could start just about every scenario with the, or every scenario that Jesus interacted with another person and you would say, now I would like to know what the definition of love practically looks like in this situation. And then press play and read the story and you're gonna see how Jesus lived and you're gonna see what love looks like in that situation. Jesus eventually actually clarifies that. He doesn't just live it, he clarifies it with a command. He was asked, what's the most important command? He says, I, I want you to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. That's actually the command of Jesus. In every scenario you face, what if we said, what does love require me, of me or what does love look like in this situation, regardless of the scenario? What does it look like for us to say, what does love look like? Because that's the Jesus-centered approach. 
In his actions in Mark 2 and 3, Jesus shows us exactly what love looks like. Someone who loves God by practicing the Sabbath. He doesn't, he doesn't stop practicing the Sabbath. He practices the Sabbath and yet is willing to heal someone and provide food for someone who is hungry. That's just what he does. That's just because he's operated by a motive of love. Question number two. When you find yourself defending your moral position, where is Jesus? Now, can I just say, these, these questions are not intended for ammunition against the Pharisees. They get a lot. They're also not intended for ammunition on social media, and they're not intended for ammunition about, for somebody across the room. I want to encourage just for a moment, Jody again talked about this, Pastor Kirk talked about this months ago. What does it look like to be Jesus-centered in our approach? And I, there's a, so there's some questions that I just want to, I want us to stir in. I want to ask, I want to encourage us to ask these questions. What does it look like for me to be Jesus-centered? Really? Like, honestly? And as I'm having conversations with people in person, at a coffee shop, or online, I need to ask myself the question, when I'm trying to defend my moral position, where is Jesus? Is your position based on God or things that you have added along the way? As you interact with other people, are you making room for Jesus in that space? I grew up in church. I grew up having a lot of discussions about my view of right and wrong. And, and honestly, I loved a lot of that experience. I loved the debate. I enjoyed the debate. But I just, I have to say sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes, I just don't think Jesus was in the conversation anymore. It was about me winning an argument. I just, I think sometimes when we, when we present ourselves to the church, I think sometimes we're not actually stepping forward in the hands and feet of Jesus. I think, I think sometimes we're just trying to win an argument. I think sometimes he, has, he is more interested in checking the condition of someone's heart than challenging their theological opinion. So kind of connected to this, when you predetermine what the activity of God looks like in someone's life, intentionally or not, you can shift their focus from God to you. This is tricky for parents because there's sometimes when you just have to set some, some rules, right? But I just wanna, I wanna push a little bit of attention into this conversation, that, you, that we just have to walk the balance, the tightrope of this as parents. And, and for every, anyone in any relationship, honestly. But it's just a bit extra tricky for parents because there's rules that you need, to, you need to enforce. But somewhere in there, when you predetermine what a rule or the activity of God needs to look like in the life of someone else, it's possible to shift the focus and now their eyes are on you and their eyes are not on Jesus. And we don't always do it intentionally, but sometimes we can do it. When we choose what righteousness looks like for another person, we can shift the focus. And we are no longer parenting from a Jesus-centered perspective. We are no longer having coffee from a Jesus-centered perspective. We're trying to win arguments. And I just don't think that's what Jesus always does. Okay, I'll keep going. Question number three. How do we take a Jesus-centered approach to Sabbath? Whew. This is a big question. This is a good question. We try to experience, sometimes I think, and, and just as, as we process Sabbath and what it looks like in our culture, because again, I really hope you don't walk away from here going, man, Jesus didn't care about Sabbath. Furthest from the truth, Jesus stepped into Sabbath. He engaged in Sabbath. He, he, he followed Sabbath with the intent of, of drawing near to his father. So I, I, wonder, I wonder, what does it look like for us to experience, sometimes, I, pardon me, I think we sometimes try to experience rest through leisure activities apart from Jesus. And I think, for myself, and I think for all of us, that we'll experience more success if we take a Jesus-centered approach as opposed to a rule-centered approach. So there's two powerful themes in, of Sabbath throughout Scripture. There's, there's one of, of rest 
and it's like a creation rhythm, and then there's one of redemption, and it's freedom from slavery for the people of Israel. And these two approaches is really, it, it's, there's two pow- rest and redemption are two powerful words that describe the activity of Jesus' life. He came to bring his, his people rest, and he came to provide a, a, a way out, freedom for his people. And G- Jesus says, in, in a better way than I could word it, he says, um, he's, he, well, he says it this way, are you tired, worn out, burnt out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to walk freely and lightly. Friends, I want us to, how do we, how do we step into this in a Jesus-centered way? I think, it's, I think it's approaching Sabbath from a place of wonder. I think there's something about walking into this time saying, what does it look like for me in my rhythm? Not monthly or yearly rhythm. What does it look like in my weekly rhythm? To experience the wonder of Jesus in my life, that I would experience rest, that I would experience freedom from what he he has for me. Where I might might begin to just sit for a moment and say, what what does the activity of God look like in my life right now? There's some great practices that we've been doing with one groups and then we're gonna continue to talk about as a church, but it's just, it's making room in our daily conversations to say, what does the activity of God look like in my life right now? Looking back for me, again, it was an important process. It was an important conversation I had with my dad when I was 10. And I I wanna tell you what my dad did that, that was really, really helpful for me. He asked me a question. He didn't just come to me with a hard and fast rule. He asked me a question, he said, here, there's a Sabbath conversation. I just want you to process it. What does it look like to honor Jesus? I, I, I don't say that question to manipulate you in any way. Please hear me. Because there's 10-year-olds in the room. And playing hockey is important. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm saying for me, that was a really important conversation for me to navigate priorities as a 10-year-old. And instead of just being given a rule all the time to say, this is what you need to follow, that or th- something that I don't understand, being, being forced to wrestle with that and, 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 and get down into my own heart and spirit and process, Jesus, what does it look like for me to receive rest and redemption from you in this moment? Those are good questions for us to wrestle down. Okay, question number four. If you find yourself setting traps, ask yourself who you are hunting and why. And I wish this was just lighthearted and didn't actually fit life, right? But don't you find sometimes we put ourselves in the story with the Pharisees? So I'll just, I'll leave that one there. The the last question, (laughs) the last question I I got just directly from N.T. Wright in his his commentary on this. It's a brilliant question. Because this is going to drive us for a season as a church as we process what it means to be a Jesus-centered church for Calgary. What does that mean? So here's a question from N.T. Wright. Are there ways in which the church today can get so blinded by its commitment to what appear necessary rules that it fails to see God's healing and restorative work breaking through? So, friends, I, I hope... For you, these or for me, pardon me, these questions have been helpful just to help me to kind of sit and reflect and ponder what does a Jesus-centered life actually look like as it relates to Sabbath? And, and it's, not, it's not the pharisaical approach of adding laws, but there's something deeper. There's something of getting back to the heart of what God has called me into. And I wonder if I can, just, if I can pray with us. And, and there's, there's some prayer, sp- you can stay right where you are, there's some prayer spaces in the back as well. And, um, and, and I hope there's something for, for, for you to work with, with God this morning, that the Holy Spirit might be saying something into your heart, that you might be able to say, God, what is this? Which question do I need to just press into a little bit? And we're going to just invite God's Spirit to be able to speak. Um, Pete and Patrick are going to come up and lead us, and we're going to have a chance to respond through worship, and we want to just have a, be a church that's praying and seeking God in this moment. So God, I thank you that you are good. 
Oh, Jesus, I, just, I thank you that your heart, throughout this whole season, throughout all this whole series, throughout the entire New Testament, everything you do is through the lens of what it looks like to love. And, and God, I pray that you would just capture our imagination with that. What does that look like? How do we be creative with what that, how we engage with our community? How do we, how do we just be a love first church? How do I be a love first person who follows you? So Holy Spirit, we want to just give you space and time to speak into our hearts as we worship and lift you up, Jesus. We just ask for you to come and rain down and, 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 and move our hearts, challenge our hearts, and just receive the worship we have for you. In your mighty name we pray, amen. Thank you.